Sane Occultism by Dion Fortune Narrated by Matthew Schmitz 16. Occultism and Vegetarianism There has been a great deal of discussion recently concerning the necessity of a meatless diet for an occult student. Members of many different occult schools have taken part in this discussion, which seems to proceed entirely on the deductive method, arguing from first principles which may or may not be conceded by the other participants. No one so far appears to have asked, what are the actual facts of the case? What has been the practice of those who are recognized as among the masters of the occult art? Initiates are divided in this manner. Some, like Pythagoras, inculcate a strict vegetarianism. Others, like Jesus said, It is not that which goeth in at the mouth which defileth a man, but that which proceeds from the heart. Of the moderns, Max Heindel was a vegetarian. Rudolf Steiner was not. Dr. Besant is a vegetarian. Eliphas Levy was not. The Swami Vivekananda, one of the most advanced teachers of occultism who have ever come to the West from the East, poured scorn on the idea that the vegetarian diet could raise consciousness. If this were the case, he said, then the cow and sheep would be the most advanced yogis. There is evidently, therefore, room for discussion in the matter of the best diet for the occult path, and it cannot be taken as a sine qua non that vegetarian is either the best or the only possible diet. The discussion of the whole question of vegetarianism can be approached from three different points of view, the hygienic, the humanitarian, and the occult. And the occult point of view has to take into consideration both the hygienic and the humanitarian. We will consider each of these separately on their own merits and then consider them from the occult standpoint. I was once discussing the question of vegetarianism with a well-known Harley Street doctor, and he said a thing which impressed me as being the truest word I had yet heard spoken on the subject. Most people seem to think, he said, that although there is an infinite variety about our external appearance, our insides are made to a sealed pattern. In my cabinet I have a large collection of X-ray photographs, and I can recognize my different patients by the portraits of their stomachs, just as I could by the photograph of their faces. If there is so much divergency in their internal appearances, must there not be an equal divergency in their internal needs? Sir Thomas Horder pointed out in a recent article in the Lancet that argument from individual dietetic experience was valueless. A thin, hard-working, neurasthenic type of man would need one kind of diet, and a fat little dilettante with a high blood pressure would require another. He also quoted the case of a big, buxom woman with a delicate, dyspeptic husband, who said to him, Would it not benefit my husband, doctor, if he were a vegetarian like myself? Madam, he replied, I perceive that you can afford to be a vegetarian. Risking, as he said, the good lady's wrath by doing so, for it is a curious thing that even those who take up vegetarianism for health reasons, quite apart from humanitarian considerations, seem to make a religion of it, and are willing not only to suffer for their faith, but to persecute for it. Were it not for this attitude, diet reform would be on a very much sounder basis than it is today, for it is not easy to get at the truth when people are willing to pervert it on a question of principle. Undoubtedly, it must be conceded by all reasonable persons that many people have recovered health on a vegetarian diet after all else failed, but the question we here have to consider is, were they cases of physical or psychical illness? And was it the actual diet that restored to health, or their faith in it, and the possession of a new interest in life? Instead of talking of their ill health to all their friends, they now begin to talk about their good health, and the suspicion might arise that previously they were not nearly as ill as they thought they were, and that now they may not be nearly as well as they think that they are. As Sir Thomas Horder remarked, many people are well in spite of their diet fads, and not on account of them, and while we must agree that many people can and do thrive on a vegetarian diet, we must also admit that many do not. Another point in connection with a meatless diet, a point which has an important bearing upon occult training, is the observed fact that it undoubtedly does lead to increased sensitivity of the nerves. This is the reason why it is advocated as a means of furthering psychic development. Let us remember, however, that there is psychism and psychism, one kind is indeed true soul vision, 
but the other is an aberration of the imagination, and, to the latter, a lowered physical vitality unquestionably predisposes. I do not mean to imply by this that it is not possible to maintain health on a strict vegetarian diet, but I do maintain that it is not possible for everybody to do so under all circumstances. To take a person accustomed to an ordinary mixed diet and start him on a vegetarian diet and occult training at the same time is rarely satisfactory, especially if that person is engaged in a strenuous or exacting occupation or has difficulty in getting meat substitutes. This is all too often done by teachers of occultism, and it is an exceedingly unwise method of procedure. This brings us to the next point in our consideration. Should the follower of the path stick to his vegetarianism, whether it suits him or not, and whether he can obtain meat substitutes or not? Some would say yes and act up to it, but other considerations come into the matter. It is not possible for anyone to follow the strenuous experiences of a genuine occult training unless he is in good health. The path is no place for a weakling, as many a one has found to his cost. Equally, if a person sticks rigidly to his vegetarianism in spite of all drawbacks, is he to be admitted to an occult training regardless of his physical condition? No occult teacher worthy of the name would do so. There are, in my experience, an instability and lack of ballast among faddists of all ways of thinking which do not form a good foundation for that study of all others which requires a level head and an iron nerve. Extremes have never been a success in any walk in life. One might define the crank as a man who cannot see the wood for one solitary tree against which he has glued his nose. If the highest ideals are not governed by a sense of proportion, that man's work for humanity will be out of the true will, in fact, be cranky in the literal sense of the word. I am afraid that I have a constitutional dislike of extremes of any sort, and I believe that it is better to see life steadily and see it whole than attempt one-sided reforms. The more I see of the occult world, the more I deplore the general absence of an impartial and scientific attitude. The question of diet should be approached from the standpoints of physiology and psychology, as well as from that of idealism especially in view of the fact that different teachers differ in their ideals. The question of vegetarianism from the humanitarian standpoint is also an extremely vexed question, and not nearly so simple as its advocates would have us believe. The whole issue must depend upon our attitude towards the domestication of animals. Was it wrong to domesticate them? Are domestic animals essential to civilization? If we admit that the exploitation of one natural kingdom by another is fundamentally wrong, people of sensitive conscience will feel it incumbent upon them to refrain from participating in that exploitation. But the exploitation consists of much more than flesh-eating. The wearing of leather boots and bone buttons, the use of glue, size, hair, and a thousand other of the byproducts of animal life have to be considered. Every time we hold on by a strap in a train, we are availing ourselves of the products of animal slaughter. This argument is, of course, a reductio ad absurdum and shows that the advocacy of vegetarian diet cannot safely be pursued along these lines. As long as we have the domestication of animals, we shall have their slaughter at the hands of man, even if that slaughter be the merciful dispatch of the aged and diseased or the destruction of the superfluous males. Unless we are prepared to take our stand for the total abolition of animal domestication, we shall never get away from the taking of animal life. Do the brethren of the Great White Lodge, under whom all occultists take their initiations, and to whom they look as teachers and masters, require that their pupils should refrain from having any participation in the taking of life in any form? We know that some of the Eastern schools do so teach, for the Jain priests carry a soft broom with them, and gently sweep the path before them as they walk, lest they should accidentally tread on some creeping thing and take its life. We also know that certain Indian ascetics refused to remove maggots from their sores, even going to the length of replacing them when they fell off, saying, I would not inconvenience thee, brother. Such an attitude has never found favor in the West. The medieval saints, like blessed Henry Suso, did not refrain from cleanliness, lest it should be the occasion of discomfort to their vermin, but lest it should be the occasion of comfort to themselves. What, then, should be our attitude as practical seekers after the light, coming to it by a western path? I do not think we can find a better model than our Lord and Master. 
He was indeed the master of compassion, but he was no sentimentalist, neither was he in any way a crank. It has always been noteworthy that he never inculcated any extreme form of humanitarianism, but rather a compassionate attitude towards all things, great and small. Out of such an attitude, right relationships with the animal kingdom must come, just as right relations with the human kingdom must come. But just as we are not yet in sight of the abolition of war and prisons and the burden laid upon man of earning his bread in the sweat of his brow, so we are not within sight of the abolition of animal domestication and all that inevitably goes with it. The abolition of unnecessary suffering is undoubtedly incumbent upon us, but as long as domestic animals are with us, it is hardly possible to give them a greater share in the amenities of life than human beings enjoy. In considering all practical problems, especially those which have to be worked out on a large scale, it is not possible always to find out the abstract right and then go and do it. We often have to be content with what is practicable at the moment, or even the lesser of two evils. There will always be sensitive people who, when they realize the suffering that goes to the production of some of the food we eat and the clothes we wear, will refuse to partake of that food or wear those clothes because they are so keenly alive to that suffering. No one can say that this is other than a noble sacrifice than they are making, but do the masters require this sacrifice of their pupils as a condition of acceptance? That is our problem as practical occultists. The answer lies in the fact that not all initiates have been abstainers from the use of animal products. Therefore, obviously, such an abstination is not a sine qua non of occult work, even though it may be a specific requirement of certain occult schools. There are two ways of obtaining perception of a subtler vibration, either by focusing and magnifying the vibrations, or by increasing the sensitivity of the receiving instrument. Some occult schools use the latter method, and therefore they askew the use of meat in order to obtain the greater nervous sensitivity, which a meatless diet undoubtedly does produce, although there is a serious reason to believe that this sensitivity is of the same type as it is produced by a prolonged fast, and is really the temporarily heightened mental activity due to malnutrition. It has been the practice of most occult and mystic schools to induce a temporary exaltation of consciousness by abstination, and such practices, rightly employed, are undoubtedly part of the system of occult training as practiced by all races. But the wise occultist realizes that such a heightening can be but temporary, and that there is a price to pay for these practices. He may decide, and quite legitimately, that the gain is worth the price, but there comes a point when the price becomes extortionate, and if he be wise, he will not push his abstinence, whether from stimulating foods or from food itself, beyond the point where the price outweighs the gain. His aim, as an occultist, is the exaltation of consciousness for the sake of the experience so gained, not the salvation of the animal kingdom. This is the point where clear thinking is needed. In abstention from flesh foods, is the occultist motivated by humane ideals or a desire for knowledge through the exaltation of consciousness which follows an abstinence? And if the latter, to what point can he carry that abstinence without impairing his health? The answer to this question must be entirely individual, because individuals vary so enormously in their stamina and dietetic needs. One thing is quite certain, that a man in a poor state of health is as little likely to succeed on the occult path as he is in any other exacting vocation. To sum up, my judgment in the matter would be that a restricted diet is used by certain schools of occult training in order to produce enhanced sensitiveness. Such a method is satisfactory provided that the person thus rendered sensitive can be sheltered from the shocks and buffets of life. Otherwise, it is a disastrous method to pursue. It is a method which is seldom successful in the West because the Western Constitution is not easily rendered sensitive, and therefore devitalization has to be carried to considerable lengths before it becomes effective, and the line between refinement and debilitation is hard to draw. This method is especially undesirable for anyone who is leading the ordinary life of the world and is obliged to work under the pressure of modern city conditions. It is rendered additionally difficult by our cold and variable climate, if, however, a student elects to enroll in an occult school which uses this dietetic method, he would naturally have to adhere to the discipline he has chosen. I therefore do not advocate the use of these methods in the West 
because I have seldom observed them to be satisfactory as a means of opening up the higher consciousness among Europeans. I would ask it to be noted that I do not include astral psychism under the term higher consciousness, and it very frequently produces a debility which renders any form of efficient work impossible. The advice that was given to me by my own teacher, I believe to be sound. Follow the customs of the country in which you are domiciled, and thereby enter sympathetically into the life of its group soul. Be, however, on the abstemious side. Do not indulge the flesh, but do not estrange yourself from the group life by eccentricities and affectations. The occultist needs to keep himself physically fit for his exacting work. If he prefers a vegetarian diet by reason of taste or conscience, by all means let him have it. There is no objection to vegetarianism as a diet so long as it is giving satisfactory results. The thing against which the common-sense student of occult science must set his face is the elevation of vegetarianism into a fetish, and the persistence in it when, owing either to personal idiosyncrasies or circumstances, it has proved a failure. In view of the fact that so many of our greatest initiates have been flesh-eaters, it is useless to argue that vegetarianism is an essential upon the path, for obviously it cannot be, or they would not have been initiated. The person with the sensitive conscience and the vivid imagination will no doubt eschew flesh foods because of his feelings in the matter, and his scruples are entitled to respect, as is all sincerity. But as sane occultists, we must deny the contention that vegetarianism is a sine qua non of occult development. We must also draw attention to the fact that the results of it are very often entirely negative from the occult point of view and extremely unsatisfactory from the health point of view. Let those who wish to be vegetarians, for whatever reason, humane or dietetic, have the liberty to be vegetarians, and if their health under such circumstances permits, follow any pursuit that seems good to them. But let us frankly face the fact that occult development, for the man of Western race at any rate, is not dependent upon any particular diet, so long as that diet is healthful, and let us once and for all explode the idea that only a vegetarian can be an initiate, for the facts show us that this is not the case. Occult science needs to rely more on an appeal to facts and less on appeals to first principles, which may very well be fanciful. It has not yet freed itself from the trammels of the Middle Ages and still uses pre-Baconian methods, depending on argument and authorities rather than on observation and experimentation. I have been much struck by the fact that in the vegetarian controversy, which raged at one time in the pages of The Occult Review, no one appealed to experience, which would have revealed the undoubted fact that meat-eaters were among the greatest of the world's occultists. I hold strongly the belief that we can only base our civilization on an ethical basis, but I hold equally strongly the belief that the ethic has to be sane and practical, and that the right way is usually halfway between two extremes. I deprecate the use of pâté de foie gras and ospreys, and equally I deprecate the Eastern ascetic with his broom and his maggots. Likewise, I deprecate the attitude of mind that repudiates the use of fur, but accepts the use of leather. I also have my doubts of the idealist who does not find the teaching of the Gospels sufficiently lofty for his needs.